Hi, this is Paul Turner with Venify. And in this session of SSH 101, we're going to talk about the major components of SSH. This will help give you a good grounding. So as we move forward and start talking about some of the security risks, as well as best practices for addressing those risks, you'll have a better understanding of what these risks and best practices apply to. So let's go ahead and jump in. Let's say that I'm Bob and I've got a server, server one. And I'm responsible for administrating access to that. And one of the administrators for the applications on this server is Sally. And she needs to be able to log in to the server remotely and perform her operations with the command line. To do this, first of all, obviously, she's going to need an account on the server. But in addition to that, I've got to give her some way of accessing the server. So I'm going to set up SSHD or an SSH server. And as I'm going through these components, by the way, You'll notice that I'm going to be talking about OpenSSH specifically. It's the most popular and broadly used SSH implementation. There are other implementations, but in this case, we'll just talk about OpenSSH. So here, Bob will go ahead and install or activate uh, SSHD. Oftentimes, it's activated by default on uh, many systems. And by virtue of that, when it gets activated, there's going to be a key pair that's generated to authenticate that server. Now, on many servers, based on every algorithm that they support, there may be multiple keys like this, but we're just going to focus on one key pair that's used to authenticate this server. So this particular key pair is used for this server to authenticate itself to any clients. We'll, we'll understand that a little bit better here in a moment. Now, in addition to that key pair, there's also a configuration file, which is very important for SSHD. It's called SSHD underscore config. And this configuration file has options in it that allow you to configure things that impact operations, but more importantly, security. In a future session, we'll talk a little bit about some of those options. Now, with this server set up, Sally needs some components so she can connect. She's going to need some sort of an SSH client. This can be the SSH command line, which is provided by OpenSSH, or it can be PuTTY or some other SSH implementation. Let's say in this case, she's going to use the SSH command line. Now with that, there also is a configuration file which impacts both operations and security. This is called SSH underscore config. Now with these pieces in place, Sally can now connect up to the server and you'll notice that the server provides back its public key when she connects. And the first time that she connects, her client's going to say, wait a minute, we haven't connected up to server one before, or if we have, I'm seeing a public key I haven't seen before, but one way or another it's saying, I'm seeing a public key for server one that I need you to review. And it will display that key for her. Now, she should do some due diligence, maybe check with Bob and say, okay, can you make sure this is the correct public key? Frankly, in most cases, a lot of uh, people that are using SSH will just type yes or click yes or whatever they need to do to get that out of the way. And when they do that, what happens is it gets stored. When Sally does this, it gets stored in a known host file, as, it call, as it's called. And with that, there's the key, the public key, and also the name of the server. And so with this, each time that she types in server one going forward, it will, if it gets back the same public key, it'll say, I trust this already, and it won't prompt Sally at all. So obviously it's important that she makes sure that it's the right public key. Again, most users don't. Once we have these pieces in place, the SSH components on either side, the client and the server, can encrypt that session, and now she can log in securely with her password. It will be encrypted and provided to the server. It can verify that uh, password, and now she can log in and perform her operations. But let's say that Sally, she manages quite a few servers and she gets sick and tired of typing in her password every time. So she does some Googling and she realizes, hey, wait a minute, I can go and I can generate my own key pair, which includes a private key and also a public key. And because Bob has allowed me to, I can go place that public key that I've generated into a file called an authorized keys file in my account. And once I do this, the next time I go to log in, I will be able to log in without having to put in my password. Now, I may have protected that private key with a passphrase. We'll talk about this in a future session. And so I would have to enter that at that time. But in general, for the server, I don't have to enter in the password for that server. I'm basically authenticating with what's called public key authentication. Now, as we mentioned, Sally logs into a variety of different servers. So let's, let's bring another server into the picture. 
If she connects up to that server, again, the first time she connects, she's going to be prompted for the, the public key for server 2, and she has to confirm, yes, this is in fact a public key. When she does that, her client will place that into the Nose host file and be trusted going forward and never prompted again. And now what she'll need to do is, if she wants to authenticate into this server without having to put in her password, she needs to go ahead and place that authorized keys file again. It'll be uh, subject to the administrator on that server allowing her to, which frankly he shouldn't, but it's generally the, the normal practice, it's the default practice that most administrators do. So now she can go ahead and authenticate in this server without having to put in her password. Now let's say that as part of the application that she manages, she wants to have a script that runs, let's say at midnight on server two, automatically log in to server one and perform its operations with no intervention from her. To do this, what she's got to do is first she needs an account for that application. We're just going to call it server two to keep it simple. She'll need a similar account on server one. We'll also call that one server two. And now what we need to do is she is going to need some sort of an SSH client on that server. And um, most Unix and Linux systems automatically have a Linux client on them. And in terms of Windows, you have to add that. Now we have an SSH client that she can use for connecting this automated application. And so the next piece is she's going to need to, to set up the connection between those two accounts. First, she's going to have to trust server one's public key, just like she did here. When the first time she connects up, she's going to go, need to go ahead and make sure that um, it trusts server one's public key. And then since she wants to go ahead and make sure that that application, each time it wakes up, doesn't have to provide a password, she's going to generate a key pair, a private key and a public key. The private key she'll place into the account for that application, and the public key she'll place in the authorized keys file for server two in that particular account or under that home directory. At that point, this automated application can automatically connect. And what you see now is we've got several different pieces here, three, uh, one user and, and two servers, and we've got quite a few keys in play. And as we go into some of the risks, you'll start to see how all these different components can either help you with security or frankly become a liability. So hopefully that gives you a good overview of the major components. In the future, we'll talk about some of the risks that these components can generate if they're not properly used, and also some of the best practices for mitigating those risks. Thank you very much for taking the time today, and hope you've enjoyed the video.